So my mission today is to be educated, but also to provide you perspectives and hopefully, and perhaps most importantly, to try to inspire you who sit here and who listen on the internet. Perspectives, perspectives. We are here because the buildings around us are 100 years old. And so we can think of, I will try to give from time to time perspectives. What happened 100 years ago? What are we doing today? What's going to happen within 100 years? And now in technology, that is very tricky to do. Because technology develops and has developed for the past couple of centuries exponentially. But we humans, we are trained to think linearly. So if you look what happened in 1917, and then we look what happens today, and then if we think what will happen 2117, we tend to think linearly. But actually what we're thinking will happen will actually already happen within 30 years, not within 100 years. So what will happen within 100 years, we have no clue. Nevertheless, I will try to make some estimates, some predictions, whatever, that perhaps may be true. We can start with uh, the building where we are. From 1917 to 2017, campus, actually, and this is for the people in the future, you know, what is a university campus? A university campus is a physical place where people get together to get educated and to gain new skills. Yeah? It has been so for the past 100 years. It may be not at all within 100 years, because if we look at technological development, what we learn in, in terms of brain interfacing and computational power, what we're learning is that perhaps education within 100 years just means in one second uploading the, the, the grown-in brain update system that you already have implanted. You know? And so you could become an engineer within a second. Who knows? <laughs> we also do research. And research, we didn't do... Well, there was some of that in 1917, and that the amount of research has percentually grown a lot and is much more important now. But maybe within 100 years, if we look what's happening in artificial intelligence today, we may think that research, maybe within already 50 years from now, will be much more efficient if it's done by robots and machines than by actually people. We don't know. Let's see. Nevertheless, I was going to talk about micro nanosystems. I'm an engineer in micro and nanosystems, and what that means is that I'm good in building small things, small stuff. Typically, millimeter, thousand times smaller micrometer. A million times smaller than a millimeter is a nanometer, and in that scale, we build physical systems and we use them. For example, for life sciences, also for other things. But let me first take a look at when got I in contact with microsystems. And it was when I saw a picture very much like this one, that was a reprint uh, in a newspaper in 1994. I lived in Belgium at the time, and I saw this picture, and this is an electromotor, uh, this is an engine. This wheel here has a diameter of 100 micrometer, that's the same size as your human hair. And this thing can actually spin up to speeds of 100,000 rounds per minute, really, really fast. And when I saw this picture and I read, micro machines can turn electromotors, like, what? Is that possible? I was totally, that was fantastic. You know. Who was I in 1994? I'm going to stand here because this is me. You see, we still look the same. 24 years, nothing has changed. I lived in Belgium, studied engineering in uh, the University of Leuven. I didn't know really what I wanted with my life, but there were some things that I knew. I wanted to see the world, I wanted to travel, I wanted to have fun. I want to make a lasting impact in the world, but still now. I did not want to work in industry, I knew that for sure. And I was in search for a master thesis topic. And so I saw this picture and I thought, this is cool enough that I want to do my master's thesis in. And I wanted to travel, so I started looking around. Internet didn't exist, but via contacts at the university, I figured out there was a professor here, in, uh, Professor Jürgen Stemme, and he was a professor in micro nanosystems here. And so I arranged to do a master's thesis here. And there comes my, I have to introduce now, my big enabler throughout my life. I have realized by making this presentation, the European Union. European Union, what is that? Well, it's a club. It's, it's a club, and I'm a member of the club, and many of you here are a member of this club. You pay a membership fee of about 180 euros per year, and the base package, what you get is peace, prosperity, human rights, open border, free trade. And on top of that, I got money for a four-month exchange in Sweden. Yay! And so I entered the world of microsystems. First thing that happened when I arrived in Sweden, or very soon, I saw a very beautiful woman, and I fell totally in love with her and I could convince her to become my girlfriend. It took some effort, but it worked. And this woman became my wife and the mother of my three children now. And so I would say that this investment of 180 euro per year, best investment ever. <laughs> 
Back to micro nanosystems. What are they and where are they? Well, they are everywhere around us. For example, in your mobile phone, there's at least 20 microsystems in the form of microsensors, very typically. Same in cars, they're used a lot in medicine. I'm going to give some examples of that. And let's straight jump to that. So in cars, a modern car typically has 50 to 100 sensors built in. And they do everything. Your car knows when it's raining because then it can control when it has to put on the wiper. Or it knows the, it has pressure sensors, so it knows what is the pressure in your tires. It knows when you're hitting something, so it can release the airbags. It knows when it's going to roll. It has a night vision camera, so it sees if an, an object is going to cross the road and it can start uh, braking without you even noticing. So they're everywhere. But how do they really look like? Well, if you would go inside a car, and start looking for them, you would find little boxes that might look something like this. It can be centimeter down to a few millimeter in size. And they're very non-distinct. Huh? But if you open them, there's all the magic. Inside are very cool micro-mechanical structures. I'm just going to sh shortly talk about two of them. This is a pressure sensor, typically. Actually, it's a flat balloon, you see? It's a flat balloon. And it's inside, for example, inside the, the, the tire. And so if the pressure change in your tire, this balloon will inflate or deflate. And so you have these little semiconductor wires running here, and they will measure a change in resistance. And so in that way, you can measure the pressure of your tire. Another example is, this is a zoom-in view of a night vision camera. And these are individual pixels of the night vision camera. And night vision cameras, they sense heat. So they, ha they sense photons in infrared. These are generated by heat. And so there's a, a couple of photons hit this little plate here. This plate is suspended by two arms, so it's freely hanging above a substrate. Underneath here is all the electronics, but this plate is hanging above the electronics. If a photon hits it, the plate heats up just a tiny bit, but that's enough to detect a resistance change and to know, okay, had photons hitting it. And this is the way you make a picture. This is just showing how it looks on the inside. Perspectives. You think like, okay, <laughs> why am I doing what I'm doing? Why, I mean, people in microsystems built microsensors for car safety. And, but in the big scale of things, what is the meaning of that? I mean, 100 years ago, people, personal transport was by horse, no vehicles. There were, there were, there were automobiles in Sweden, about 10,000. That means that less than 1% of Swedish people had access to a car. And so, of course, there was a train system if you want to go from city to city, but if you wanted to go somewhere in the countryside for a longer distance, it was the horse. And now, in our time, everybody has a car or access to a car, so this is our way of transport. But within 100 years, we have no idea, you know? People might think, why would you use... Why would you use a vehicle to transport yourself? What a crazy idea. I don't know. Examples of medicine, of, of a microsystem in medicine. I'm only going to show two examples. And these are commercially available for more than a decade, used in widely in society and in clinics here in Sweden. One example is the pill camera, or the camera pill. It's a small object. You swallow it, and it has, what you see here, the black thing is the, the lens of the camera. There's a battery here. There's a little uh, coil that can trans... Uh, transport information to a package that sits outside on the patient. And so if you swallow this pill, it goes to your esophagus, inside the stomach, into the small intestine, into the large intestine, and comes out the natural way within one to two days. And it films everything it sees on the way. Then after two days, you bring the package back to the clinic, and the, the physician can see, he can see, for example, do you have a tumor, or do you have a lesion, or is there a need for an operation? Cochlear implants, another great example is used today. Here you see a picture of such a thing. See, basically, it's a wire with up to 20 electrodes that are put inside the cochlea for in people that have bad hearing or that are deaf. And so you have a microphone on the outside that transmits sound, or the, the signal, sound signal to a, uh, a receiver that is implanted, some electronics that steer these electrodes. And here, this electrode, every electrode co is coupled to a few hair cells, and they stimulate so you get a hearing experience. Examples of microsystems in healthcare. Perspectives. A hundred years ago, they had actually one really cool type of medical technology, this one. This is a Röntgen tube. So Röntgen radiation had been discovered end of 19th century and was known. But what the people that built this building around us, what they did not have, for example, was antibiotics. So if they would build and they would cut themselves, they better clean very carefully their wounds and hope that they didn't get an infection into the bloodstream because that would be fatal. Yeah? They didn't have antibiotics to treat such things. Another thing they didn't know was, was viruses. 1917, this is the outbreak of the Spanish flu. Milli tens of millions of people died during this epidemic. And people knew there is something that makes you sick. But they would have sick people, they would take bodily fluid, they would see in a microscope that there was like human cells, and they would see there's bacteria, they could see those. But if they would filter out everything, all the debris, and they had a clear liquid left, that liquid would still be infectious if you gave it to another individual. And they knew that. So there's something in the liquid that makes you sick. And only in 1931, 
the invention of the electron microscope was the first time that people realized a virus is a particle. You couldn't see it before. So you see we have made a big leap. Now if you look at diagnostics more specifically, 100 years, of course, we had, we had a Röntgen. Today, the a major research hypothesis is that we should follow people's biomarkers, and typically biomolecular markers. So you follow maybe hundreds of protein levels that are in your blood on a regular basis, and then you get a fingerprint of your patient. And if patients get sick, you, you take a sample and you see is there a difference from the regular fingerprint, and that should tell you what kind of disease you have. This is, so you see a lot of effort now being built in building this biomolecular diagnostic device and making them very cheap and available in healthcare. A hundred years from now, this may be totally obsolete, because if you look at imaging technologies and computational power growing, maybe you have scanners, you put your patient to a scanner, you scan the patient on the molecular level, you know, all the molecules, you load that into the database, and basically you can simulate your patient. And so you can simulate treatments, and then you know what is the best treatment. I think that is a, actually a, quite a realistic way of thinking about it. There's also an etc. Just to show you what people are playing with, this is the American Army working on beetles and making, putting small antennas and electronics on beetles and then putting that in the sensory organ so you can actually with a remote control steer of the beetle, if you put a current here, the beetle will fly to the left and you put the current there, the beetle will fly to the right. There's a lot of research in this area because people want to put small cameras and batteries on that. You can use that for reconnaissance. Very cheap, self-powered systems. <laughs> My own research focus today is a lot on lab on a chip. Basically, I miniaturize chemical labs. And a chemistry lab is typically used for two things. Either you measure something, and in medicine that becomes diagnostics, or you produce some new material to synthesize something. And then that can be drugs or, or biomaterials. I'm going to give an example of both. But first, again, back to my main donator. Not only did I get peace, prosperity, human rights, survive and kids, but in the past 10 years, the European Union has sponsored my research for roughly 40 million crowns. And that is my major source of funding, so thank you for that. This is one of the diagnostic projects we've been working on for, for the past five years. This is Gaspar Pardon, one of my ex-students. He was co-developing this device where you blow in, and the idea is that we can measure if the patient has uh, influenza. So you blow out, and in the breath we were going to try to trap the influenza particles. I'm going to very quickly hand wavelengthly show how this is done. So you blow into the instrument. When you blow, there's a lot of small droplets of, of liquid coming with it, and the influenza is in the small droplets. We capture them in a small vial. So you have your virus in the vial, and then you chemically lyse it, and the virus opens up and releases all its proteins. In this vial, you also have little magnetic bullets. They are two micron in size. Two micron, that's something between the size of bacterium and the size of a blood cell. And so the small magnetic bullets are swimming around and they meet this and they very specifically can bind to each other. So these guys fish out these proteins. And after a couple of minutes, we suck them down magnetically onto the bottom of this, play, of this uh, device. And in the bottom, we have a lot of small little holes, typically 100,000 of them. And in every hole, there's one such bullet. So these holes are typically two micron size. You have one bullet per hole. And then you close them off and then you run a chemical reaction. And if the bullet has captured the protein, it will release a light signal. And so you take a camera and you film that. And so you count how many light dots that I have. That gives me an estimate of how many proteins that has. That gives me an estimate how many viruses were there. And so I can tell something about the disease state of my patient. We also work on therapy, um, specifically uh, local chemotherapy. So patients that have cancer are often treated with chemotherapy, and that means that you inject a toxin into the patient. And so that's very bad for the patient, of course, but it's hopefully worse for the cancer cells than for the healthy cells. Yeah? So you give as much toxin as the patient can withstand and hope that you kill as much cancer as you can. Of course, it's very bad. So our take on that is, what if we could build a drug factory, miniaturize it, and implant it inside the tumor of the patient, and so we generate the toxin only inside the tumor? Yeah? So that's what we're out to do. And this is how it looks like if you do that. This is a 100 micrometer diameter particle. Again, this is the size of a human hair. And inside here, we have uh, maybe 15 uh, cells, living cells. They're genetically modified. And these cells, they, if you know, th these this particles you inject in the bloodstream that goes directly into the tumor, so they get stuck in the tumor. And once they are there, you give systemically to the patient a harmless prodrug, and when the prodrug reaches this bullet, it's converted to cytostatic, and you, get a very high, you can get a very high dose of cytostatic, but only very locally in the tumor. So this is the technology we work on. This is what I do today. 
I also want to show my vision for systems in a micro nanoscale of tomorrow. And let's start, we call that programmable matter. And where it starts is by looking at nature. We know that all living organisms on the micro scale are built out of cells. Very few cell types build a lot of diverse types of organisms. And we have big, static, beautiful buildings that we call trees. And we have very clever, intelligent robots, for example, that we call humans. The human is the most perfect robot we know of today. Yeah? And so my hypothesis is, if a biolog biological cell can build such a variety of structures, why couldn't we build an artificial cell on the same scale and with a similar morphology? And use that to build, plug them together to materials, reconfigurable materials, and use these materials to build objects. So why would we do that? Why would we build, build micromodular materials? Well, for one, it would give us ubiquitous access to goods. So imagine that I have a bucket of this kind of cells at home, and I want to buy a new jacket, and I find a nice design on the internet, I can download it from the internet, send it to the bucket, and say, build me this jacket, and whoosh, there it builds a jacket, and I can put it on. Huh? I have ubiquitous access to whatever I want. The material can also be 100% recycled, because at the end of the day, maybe I'm really tired of my jacket, I put it back in the bucket, and the next day I make a bicycle out of it. So every material, in theory, can be recycled in another material, because everything is built out of similar building blocks. Economy of scales. A rough back-of-the-envelope calculation shows that if I would build all one, one pro meal, so 1,000 of all households in the world, that's about the same household in Sweden, out of this material, I would need this amount of cells. This is 10 to the power 22. That is 10,000 billion, billion, billion cells to build. Yeah? My human body is built out of 40 trillion cells. Yeah? So you need a hell of a lot of cells to build objects. And because you need so many, they be can become extremely, extremely cheap to build. For example, today you can go down in the city, you can buy a hamburger for 10 crowns. That means a piece of bread and a b beef together for only 10 crowns. That's ridiculous that, you, that it's so cheap. And why it's so cheap? It's because there's billions of hamburgers sold in the world. That's economy of scales. Do something hugely massive and you can make it extremely cheap. So we, this has a potential for re revolutionizing uh, part of the economy also. You can also do novel things. For example, if you go on space missions, today you send a spaceship to a, a, a comet, but you have no idea how the comet looks like. So shall I send a drill or shall I send a servo? Why not to just to send a bucket of this material and you build it in situ, what you need? If the material is self-adaptable, a blob of material can transform itself into a small snake and go to a very small hole and on the other side build up itself again. Huh? And then you can start thinking of what can you do with that on the biological side, medical side. So. An implant hip, why, why take out the hip and put something new? Why not just inject this kind of small cells and they build themselves in situ and they adapt the material properties you need? And if you're anyway going to build a new hip or a new knee, why not to make it better than it was so you can actually run faster? We call that enhancing technologies, not only restorative, but enhancing technologies. And so perhaps this picture shows some part of this vision. We have digitized information technology, and we see what that le leads to, to the internet and to mobile communication. Nature is digitized. Everything is built on all the micro modules. But the tools that we have today are micro tools. They are not digitized. And I think there is a big potential there to digitize the physical world around us and build the things we want. We can build this building out of such systems. Perhaps. I don't know. And this is not too far-fetched because such cells, I think you can make with the technologies that we have today in the lab. Yeah? I don't need to invent, I just need to bring together the technologies in the right way that I have accessible today. So that's what the research should do. That's my vision. As a last slide, I'm going to stop with a question to you. I talked about 2021-17 and my question to you is, what is your dream for the future? What do you, we, we built a society here at KTH. What, what is your dream? What do you want the future to be? What do you want to 2117 to be? And even if you can answer that question, my question is, and how will you do that? And if you have no idea how to do that, I would say start at KTH, because that's where here we built the future. We build dreams. We build your dreams. Thank you. <laughs>